In South Africa, the robust Australopithecines, or Australopithecus robustus, appear to fall later in time than the other hominins, Australopithecus africanus. In East Africa, the situation is more complicated, as there is definitely multiple hominin lineages at the same time. The robust Australopithecines that we'll talk about from East Africa, otherwise referred to as Australopithecus boisei, come from many of the same regions we've already talked about. The Afar region in Ethiopia, the Lake Turkana and Omo Basin in southern Ethiopia and northern Kenya, and areas such as Olduvai Gorge and Lake Natron in northwestern Tanzania. Now, again, at two and a half million years of age, we have the specimen on the left, WT17000, sometimes called Australopithecus aethiopicus. Again, it shows hyper-robust features. This huge sail-like sagittal crest in the back, a massive compound nuchal torus, a very prognathic face, and huge projection and uh, a giant, basically, set of teeth, presumably, that go along with it. Now, a little bit later in time, a little bit after two million years of age, perhaps slightly later than the robust Australopithecines in South Africa, we have the emergence of another robust lineage in East Africa. OH5 was the earliest of these specimens discovered, found at Olduvai Gorge, and initially referred to as the Nutcracker Man, in the sense that it was thought that the large masticatory apparatus of this specimen corresponded to eating very hard foods, such as nuts and seeds. Now we'll talk a little bit later about actually the dietary ecology of these robust lineages, but for now it's interesting to simply note the morphology and the morphological differences. Although OH5 and the other robust Australopithecines from East Africa, Boisei, share many functional similarities presumably with this earlier Aethiopicus specimen, in actuality in fine details, there's not a lot that necessarily connects them in terms of the overall pattern of morphology. Although they both have large chewing apparatuses, the rest of the morphology suggests that there's a lot of differences between Aethiopicus and Boisei. And it's possible that Aethiopicus, again, doesn't connect later in time with Boisei. That might simply be a convergence on similar kinds of characteristics. Again, as I, when I introduced Aethiopicus, it's an enigmatic specimen. We're not quite sure where it fits in place in time. But by the time we get to Boisei, there's a lot of specimens for Boisei and good evidence about the overall morphology that we see. And we see a lot of similarities to the Robustus from South Africa, but in a slightly different form. Again, if we look at KNM ER406 here on the left, this is a specimen from the Turkana Basin, we again see a very large zygomatic arch, a very projecting zygomatic process. Again, the anterior displacement puts us in line with the large buckled chewing teeth in the jaw, again maximizing the efficiency of the overall chewing structure. We have a posterior sagittal crest on this specimen, associated again with this large temporalis muscle that was situated here. We have this long zygomatic arch. We have, again, a little bit of subnasal prognathism, though perhaps a little bit less than some of the robust specimens from South Africa. The anterior projection of the zygomatic also, once again, gives us a zygomatic arch and chewing structure that projects out in front of the face, again giving us a little bit of a dished out face. So many similarities to the robustus specimens in South Africa, although slight differences in terms of the exact pattern of morphology that we see in these specimens. Like the South African robust Australopithecines, those from East Africa, Australopithecus boisei, also seem to show a large amount of sexual dimorphism. KNM ER406 here on the left from the Turkana Basin, and KNM ER732 seen on the right, are both coming from the same time period in the same place, and yet they probably represent male, in the case of ER406, and female specimens, in the case of ER732, on the right. And again, there's similar overall morphology. Uh, we can see again the flat, fairly flat, scooped out face. We can see the anterior position of the zygomatics. But in this case, the features particularly associated with the chewing complex are a little bit more reduced in 732. Although we still have a very large temporalis muscle that would have sat here, it doesn't seem to occupy quite as much expression as it does in the 406 specimen. We don't necessarily have a big sagittal crest, and although the teeth are still large, they're perhaps not as large as in the 406 specimen. So overall, if we think about this pattern of variation that we're seeing, we again have a robust lineage in East Africa, coming from at least about 2 million years of age, extending actually all the way to about 1.2 million years of age. Now the picture in South Africa appears to be that Australopithecus africanus, the grass isle Australopithecine, precedes Australopithecus robustus, the more robust one. And it's possible that Robustus is at the same time as Australopithecus sediba, that interesting new specimen which we talked about last week. In East Africa, the picture is also complicated, maybe even more so. We know there's the specimen Australopithecus garhi at two and a half million years of age, though it may be something very similar to Australopithecus africanus in South Africa. But by two million years of age, we have the beginnings of the Australopithecus boisei lineage, this robust lineage, but we also have the beginnings of our genus, the genus Homo beginning at 2 million years and obviously persisting to the present. 
Now, Boisei might have persisted as long as 1.2 million years of age, meaning for an extended time, maybe as much as 800,000 to a million years, early Homo and Australopithecus Boisei may have occupied similar or the same environments in East Africa, making it an interesting evolutionary question as to how exactly they were able to coexist within these environments. Coming up, we're going to talk about the dietary ecology of these robust lineages. What exactly were they eating? Why did the evolution select for such a large masticatory apparatus? Now that will actually provide some clues to how specimens such as Boisei were able to occupy similar or the same environments as East Africa as early members of our genus for as much as a million years and not outcompete one or the other. So we'll talk about that coming up.